All right, so we're going to move on to the main agenda of the day, which is Asia Speaks Forum. So without further ado, I would like to welcome the speakers of the day. All right, so from we have two speakers from Japan and one speaker all the way that come with me from Malaysia, the one that our um, Dr. Waishala mentioned just now. But for the first one, our first panel, we have Ms. Miki Fujita, fourth year student uh, from Department of International Relations, Faculty of Foreign Studies, University of Kita Kyushu. Please welcome Ms. Miki, friend. So I spoke with her just now. She's been to Malaysia and she likes Malaysia. Thank you. <laughs> right, so panel number two, uh, we have Mr. Fumi Toshi Nake. A uh, lecturer, Regional Symbiosis Center, Uni of Kita Kyushu. Um, and then move, um, so Mr. Fumito Shinake cannot be with us today. So we'll move on to the our last but not least, all the way from Malaysia, panel number three, Shariman Sharo Zaman, which is um, my fellow alumni from my core, Southeast Asia Mission to Laos. All right. And to our topic today, Urban resilience, right? So uh, a bit about urban resilience, just for you, uh, introduction. So actually, urban resilience is the capacity of individuals, community institutions, uh, businesses, and system within a city to survive, adapt, grow, no matter what kind of chronic uh, stress or acute shocks that happen to them, right? Sherman, Sherman is the expert of urban resilience. Okay, <laughs> right. So he approved my definition. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> So um, just uh, that one thing that actually Dr. Maliki uh, shared it with me, right? Um, like in Batman world, uh, Gotham City, they have um, they they suffer from this um, corruptions and also crime, a lot of crime, and they have Batman to save that, uh, them, right? But us um, in the real world, we don't have Batman. But me and Shari Mawisha, that we say that um, we have youth. So we are the Batman of our own world, hopefully. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So um, I guess uh, I'll pass the mic to uh, Miss Miki. Miss Miki to give a bit of introduction about yourself and also your uh, definition, your opinion on urban resilience. Please. Is it definition? Yeah, what your opinion on urban resilience and also introduction about you? Uh, actually, I'm from the Department of International Relations. I'm a fourth student right now. And actually, I was in Thailand before as an exchange student program for one year. And in my opinion, like, I have a experience like a lot of experience, in, especially in Thailand before, because they had like flood, especially during the summer season, the winter, uh, the summer season. And uh, it's like, it's totally like different compared to Japan and Thailand, because we have a like training when I was young, when I was, elementary student until high school student, but some of the university doing the same like training in Japan as well, but in Thailand, they, in my case, they know how like much like training for the flight or other like reasons, like causing like the winter summer season in Thailand. Mm -hmm. So I think Sometimes it's gonna be hard to live in Thailand. I, it's my experience. All right, thank you so much, Miss Miki. All right. Um. So, Sha, what about you? Like, what? A, a bit of introduction about you, and you're gonna start with your presentation, right? About urban resilience. Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, just to give uh to give all of us the insights of about what urban resilience really are really is. Yes, yeah, so, um, hi guys, um, I would like to say that if my English is a bit too fast, you can, uh, you can tell me if I should slow down. Um, my name is Sharman, and uh, I was a mechanical engineering graduate from a local university. 
Um, initially, I joined MyCore. Oh, no, initially, I was a sales engineer. And then after that, I joined MyCore, quit my job for about a year, and uh, went to Laos for two months. And I learned a lot from there, where people don't have much. Clean water, uh, good food, and a home. Uh, from there, I started to dedicate myself towards animal conservation and environment. Uh, I, jane, I joined, joined Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots, where I volunteered for 45 hours in terms of uh, the environment and research on animal conservation. Uh, I learned a lot from there, especially in Malaysia. And right now, my opinion about urban resilience is simple. Urban resilience means that it's the capacity of a city to bounce back and uh, rebound from a pressure and stress. Pressure and stress can mean anything. Can mean an, a natural disaster, can be uh, immigration, can be even traffic jams. So that's in my opinion urban resilience and why it's important for us to start thinking about it think and discuss, especially in Southeast Asia. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Shariman. So one thing that I would like to share that I learned as well is that um, the relationship between uh, Fukuoka and Kuala Lumpur specifically starts on 18, 1985 when a philanthropist from Fukuoka, Tan Sri Kampo Harada, actually donated 1 billion yen to build International Youth Center with the support of Malaysian government. And actually, my core, we, uh, my core International Youth Center, we are a strategic partner. So um, as of now, my core has uh, trained and produced 348 alumni that is doing in, uh, youth volunteering, youth volunteer, leader, volunteer and help the community all around the world, like Dr. mentioned just now. So you can see like if a few years ago, uh, Tan Sri Kampo Harada doesn't, does not do much of money, maybe today me and Sharima, we cannot be here and actually share our thoughts about urban resilience. So I think that is one thing that we should like be thankful of in making, um, I believe, us as a global uh, global youth citizens, right? Okay, next, uh, and then, so I think we move on to the presentation from, um, from Dr. Uh, Professor. Uh, is left side, and the other one is uh, right side, uh, East Japan Kizuna Bond Project. So let me show you more detail about two projects. Uh, first is uh, Crime and Disaster Prevention Project. This project covers activities both before and after a natural disaster strikes. Regarding disaster prevention project, the project provides disaster prevention education for primary school students and local communities. As the post-disaster activities, the project operates volunteer centers at the request of state and local government. These two pictures are showing disaster prevention education for primary school students. In the picture above, this picture, the students are drawing a hazard map of their own town, of their own community. In the picture below, the students are visiting disaster affected areas as part of social science classes. The project also gives lectures on how to assemble cardboard beds, which is commonly used in uh, evacuation centers. So, in a sum, the project provides many kinds of disaster prevention education at primary schools, junior high schools, and community centers, aiming at people of all ages from children to adults. The second one is uh, East Japan Kizuna Bon Project. Kizuna means bon in Japanese, and it, what, it, it was a, a big keyword after uh, East Japan uh, Great Earthquake uh, to uh, get the community closer each other. This project offers medium and long-term support 
after a natural disaster strike, staying considerate of feeling of local communities. The project developed products using local The project developed products using local specialties in order to provide economic assistance to local communities and support community revitalization. <laughs> In recognition of students' active law, our university concluded disaster prevention agreement with Kita Kyushu City in March 2015. With the conclusion of agreement, our university started three activities. First, our university established a system of disaster prevention education by launching a new course, Introduction to Local Disaster Prevention, which is open to all faculties. Second, our university started to send a student delegation to local disaster prevention meeting where the local residents draft disaster management plan. Third, our university established the disaster emergency support team. The team sent our students to disaster relief centers at the request of local governments to assist the coordination of volunteers. Here is the activities of uh, disaster emergency support team. Uh, disaster emergency support team was established in April 2016. The team has supported volunteer centers three times so far. First, in Kumamoto City after the two consecutive big earthquakes in April 2016. The second, in Asakura City after the severe flooding and massive landslides occurred in July 2017. And the third in Kitakyushu City after the landslide in July 2018. Many of the students participating in the crime and the disaster prevention project and the East Japan Kizuna Bond project are registered as members of the team. Uh, let me explain the pictures. The picture on the left uh, shows the registration desk. They are matching the supply and demand of volunteers. The picture at the center shows the preparation of tools and materials for volunteers. The picture on the right shows the volunteer activity at the site. This, uh, the, our team, disaster emergency support team, uh, receiving more requests from the operation for the operation of volunteer center than relief activities at the site. So the main uh, activities of disaster emergency support team is uh, uh, kind of uh, operation of uh, volunteer centers rather than the uh, the rescue uh, activities at the site. So here are some uh, projects and activities. Uh, done by University of Kitakyushu. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Hi, hi, um, hello, guys. I know, um, I know, I tend to speak very fast. So just tell me if I'm speaking too fast. And uh, it's very cold here in Kitakyushu. Wow, my Malaysian body cannot take it. <laughs> All right. So, um, the so so the main thing about urban resilience is that not many people know about it, especially in Malaysia, because we don't often get hit by natural disasters, and most of the time, it's being hit by other Southeast Asian countries such as Indonesia and Philippines. Um, but I want to tell you something. In 1954, there was one movie that was created in Japan and it became so famous that outside of Japan, it, uh, everyone knows about this movie. In 1954, do you know this movie? I think everyone knows about it or have heard about it. Can you guess? It's a famous kaiju. Kaiju. Uh, I Gojira. Hi. Hi. So. 
So Godzilla, all right. So the ha, okay. So basically, basically Godzilla, when it first started, Godzilla came because of a lizard who was exposed to nuclear radiation. This was because Godzilla was represented in 1954 due to the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, and suddenly there was a new movie came out remake called Shin Godzilla or Godzilla Resurgence in 2016 made by Hideaki Anno, who this Godzilla was different. It didn't came from nuclear radiation. It came from the sea, and. It is a representation of the Great Tohoku earthquake of 2011, 3/11, where on on 11th March 2011, uh, Japan's biggest earthquake in their recorded history, an eighth biggest earthquake in the world, happened in Japan that caused massive destruction, and both of these Godzillas represent something in Japanese culture. It is called Hokai, which I mean if. My understanding is collapse, disintegrate, or destruction. And the Japanese, they understand Hokai as a threat. And they adapt to all their buildings, all the infrastructure to go against Hokai. And the problem with Godzilla is that it is always an indestructible power. Natural disasters often happen everywhere, not only in Japan. From typhoons to great winds to uh, mudslides to earthquakes, and this year we're still in January 2020, right? This happened in Puerto Rico, earthquake, 2020. This happened in Philippines, volcano eruption. That one was obviously the bushfire in Australia. These are all natural disasters, and the next. The next Godzilla will happen soon, and it will be climate change. And for that, for us, and also for Malaysia to actually survive, we need urban resilience and the uh, United Nations Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals to help us as well. So before we start, before I start telling you guys what is urban resilience, we must know what is urban. Urban is living in a city. Relating to designating city or town, basically where you guys are right now in Kita Kyushu or Fukuoka, you're living in a city. And soon, 55% of every oh no, not soon, right now, right now, 55% of the world's population lives in urban areas, lives in cities. There is two thirds of people living in cities. Next year, 68% of the world population will live in urban areas by 2050. Now imagine this. That's like almost half of the world population living in the city. There's bound to be inequalities such as from the rich and the poor. Hence why by 2030, 600 million urban poor will be directly exposed to climate change risk. Reason being is because they cannot afford good housing. So they will have um they will have uh, inadequate plans, uh, in inadequate housing plans. Uh, clinging to slopes that are directly can be impactful to climate change, such as flooding, landslides, and extreme heat, especially in Malaysia. And sadly, 70% of cities are already dealing with the effects of climate change, and nearly all are at risk. Over 90% of all urban areas are coastal, especially in the city, and that's put most cities across the globe at risk of flooding from rising sea levels and powerful storms. Especially climate change, where the polar ice caps are melting, the seas will rise. One city, very famous, that everyone wants to go to? Venice, of course. You cannot go to Venice and enjoy while you're flooded with your clothes. Very fancy Italian clothes. So once we, once we see all these disasters, see all this climate change, what can we do about it? That's why what's re that's that's where resilience comes in. The capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. And I cannot deny the fact that Japan is one of the top tier most resilient countries in the world. Reason being is because they are part of the uh, Asia Pacific Ring of Fire, where they were hit by countless like just like Dr. Kaori said, earthquake, typhoon, tsunamis, and various other disasters. But because of that, because of the history. They are able to make their um, make their buildings, 
make the infrastructure more resilient to all these natural disasters for um, more and more people to survive out of this situation. But sadly, that doesn't come true to other countries, especially Malaysia. Malaysia has the highest percentage of population exposed to floods amongst ASEAN member states. Based on the latest report on ASEAN Risk Monitor and Disaster Management Review, published by March 2019. So, even though Malaysia doesn't, is, isn't in the uh, Asian Pacific Ring of Fire, we don't hit God earthquakes very often. We do not have volcanoes at all. Um, typhoons, majority are absorbed from the Philippines. We are definitely surrounded. But we are still hit by floods because more and more people, like I said, lives in cities and they're being exposed to the flood. For example, here. So usually in Malaysia, on the north, Kelantan and Terengganu are often hit with floods. That is my mother's hometown. So she has to live with herself every year of floods. And that's why, that's where UN Sustainable Development Goals comes in. Malaysia and Japan should work together in building a better world tomorrow. So the point is for the UN Sustainable Development Goals is from 2015 to 2030, we need to attain all these goals to at least figure out on how to make a better world for everyone. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being. And if you solve one of these, it's connected to everything. If you, if you solve gender in, in gender inequality, you would solve poverty, zero hunger, because more and more people are starting to work together and solve issues and bet have a better working environment. If you solve affordable and clean energy, you will definitely solve life below water and life on land. Everything is connected. And it comes into full circle. But now we're talking about urban resilience. And what and one as UN SDG is connected is 11, sustainable cities and communities. Make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable that's whole that's the whole point of this piece as well asia sustainable asia so one of the targets for sdg 11 is support positive economic social and environmental links between urban very urban and rural areas by strengthening national and regional development planning one of the plannings i'm passionate about is the central forest spine so this is malaysia this peninsula malaysia this is East Malaysia um, and this is the overall forest here and you can see clearly it's not together well as that one is called the heart of Borneo so it ranges from Malaysia and Indonesia Kalimantan so all these issues came because Malaysia is becoming a develop from a developing about to turn to a developed country and to do that to cater towards the economy and um, to make to make ourselves more um, developed, we build more cities, and by building more cities, we cut down more trees. As you can see in history, from 1954 to 2000s, you can see, you can clearly see that all animals can migrate from here to here, here to here. But as you cut down more of the forest, animals will start to go to urban areas. Animals will start to go to human contact. And what happens? You shoot down the animals. Hence why the sadly Sumatran rhino was extinct last year. The last female Sumatran rhino in Malaysia. They do right now still exist in Sumatra, but in Malaysia we do not have Sumatran rhinos anymore as of last year. Um, and also we have a dwindling Malayan tiger. Only 400 Malayan tigers are alive, uh, wi uh, widely alive in Malaysia right now, sadly. Hence why the, uh, the Malaysian government, in coordination with uh, United Nations Development Program, UNDP, uh, UNDP, and also other NGOs as well, are trying to develop ways to connect all these forests together so that our forests could be more protected, our forests could be more protected, and also there will be less contact animals towards the, the urban areas. But this, good, this could be a bigger challenge because, again, urban people are trying to give away their land to the forest. Back. So 
and also uh, for the target for SDG 11, by 2020, sustainable increase the number of cities and human settlements, again, overpopulation of cities, adopting and implementing integrated policies and plans in line with the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 2015-2030. Why in Sendai? It's because that's where the Great Tohoku earthquake of 2011 was near at, Sendai. So this is a, this is a framework for the UNCGs to follow, and that's and one of the seven goals, I, I, um, I shorten it to three, is increase international cooperation to developing countries, reducing damage to critical infrastructure and basic services, increase access to multi-hazard warning system and disaster risk information to people. This is what Malaysia wants to be. This is what Japan has achieved. So the point of UNSCGs is for Japan to teach us, to share with us how can we achieve this, this type of issue? And lastly, support least developed countries, including financial and technical assistance in building sustainable, resilient buildings utilizing local material. One of the biggest programs uh, made by the Japan Foundation, which every country has a Japan Foundation, has the Hands Hope, Dream and, Hope and Dreams project, where they select 20 youth leaders in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, and they all went to specific places in Japan, Sendai, Hyogo, Tokyo, um, to learn about disaster risk and how to educate better towards everyone on how to, and how people are more prepared. Because sadly, Malaysians are still um, new, to, new to natural disasters, not, not new per se, but the knowledge to to survive against uh, to survive against natural disasters is very rare for Malaysians. So I would like to I would like to say that from the beginning, from the beginning, when I say about the Godzilla's, right? Do you know those two movies? How did Godzilla was defeated? Is it by building Mecca? No, but it's merely the teamwork of the Japanese people, politicians. Engineers, doctors, construction workers, they all work together to defeat Godzilla. It's not easy and it's messy. If you watch the latest Godzilla movie, you know how messy it is. That's why we need to be prepared. So I end you with the Malay quote, Sediakan payong sebelum hujan. Prepare an umbrella before it rains. Because if you don't, you'll get wet and you'll get sick. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you so much, Hariman. That's a very impressive presentation. And I believe all of us here understand more about our resilience now. Don't we, right, Miss Miki? All right, so like Shariman said just now, we Malaysian actually, we want to learn more from Japanese, like how actually you guys prepare yourself. And you have like, um, I, from my reading, I learned that you do sustainability from home, right? You like uh, do waste management, and also the kids are taught about this, all this to be prepared from school, right? So, um, Miss Miki, uh, I would like to know more about um, like how Japanese citizens inculcate the idea of sustainability in everyday life, and also the response of Japanese people on uh, current as UN. Sustainable Development Goals, if you can. So first, in actually my experience, in my family, we make sure that if the disaster occurred, we have, we, where we have to escape the specific place. And also we store the food, the food for it, like, the flight or something and we also run other school from like elementary school until university as i mentioned before and like we training like three times a year like the fire and earthquake three times a year and like the week the school cover with the fire my life places and they come to the officer come to the school and they training how we have to 
do if the earthquake or fire happen in that time. So we, through this training, we learn how to do if it occurred, and also we have like we feel the threat that because we cannot escape the earthquakes as if I live in Japan. So we have to know that the earthquake or fire, like natural disaster, will occur is very soon. So we have a we like make sure the risk for that. And the second one, the UN, the SDF, the sustainability program. Actually, I studied the one when I was in Thailand, the university, because I didn't study too much when I was in Japan. But like Thailand is like more like in focus on the SDG program from UN. So like they invite the professor or officer from UN and they teach me how to like they teach us how you have to do from the future for the future to sustainability in our ours. So I don't I think Japanese especially in the student doesn't have much knowledge for S D D program in my opinion. In Japan, in Japan I think. All right, thank you so much, Miss Miki. Okay, so my next question will be to Shariman, of course. <laughs> All right, so Shariman, you as youth of Malaysia, right? So, so um, how do you see your actions or engagement could improve or solve issues in your community and how it could lead to change for the future world? Wow, that's a hard question. <laughs> very, very hard question, but um, even though what I've done so far last year, volunteering for to go to Laos to help people poor there, um, to see and help people research on uh, ma uh, macaques in, in Sri Manjung Pera, I don't think I can do big changes, to be fair, to be honest. But if just one, one person like me actually make something what about 10 what about 15 what about 20 if more and more people can do something together and try to find try to give value towards people who are in need then maybe we can make a bigger change we just need the numbers more and more youths should be involved full stop thank you Shah. So I, are you saying that we should have like more and more youth joining my core after this? There are more opportunities than my core. <laughs> okay, all right. To be truthful. <laughs> okay. So I think um, we will open now the, uh, the, the, to the floor, to the questions. If you guys have questions, you can like write it down. If you don't want to ask the question, we can have professor to read it for you. So if you have any questions for Shariman or Miss Miki regarding urban resilience. Or maybe um, we also, I also learned that the VVIP also are willing to answer your questions if you have questions for them as well. So Miss Miki, um, but prior to this uh, talk, have you heard of urban resilience before? A little bit, but not too not much. Yeah. Hey. Right. So I also personally, before appointed as moderator, I never heard of urban resilience, but I know the meaning, but. When I learned after listening to your presentations and professor presentations that the importance of it, because actually like more and more people are living in Kuala Lumpur, right? So, so I think it's very important for us that the youth 
going back and talk to our friends and actually advocate them about these issues so that they will be like more um, alert about it. Okay, so if there is no questions from the floor, I think we just have like last few words from the speakers today. Uh, last message they want to send to the uh, to the youth, to the participants today about this topic. Maybe you want to start with um, Miss Miki. Uh, if I think we run if the Japanese people run about the national dis disaster and how we adapt for them from the child, but you know, you mentioned that here is cold in Shirakishu, you say, but I think so this winter is kind of crazy weather because it's too hot for me in this season. <laughs> so, <laughs> 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 so like, I feel like <laughs> some of people say like it's kind of because of the climate change. So we have to know more about how it happens in the future caused by climate change. So we have to learn about the knowledge for the for Japanese people. I want to give the message for them. Thank you. Oh, that's very good. <laughs> I think. I really agree with Miss Miki that w after you telling us that this is the hottest winter, yeah. so it's like a message from the, our Mother Earth is telling us that we need to do something about climate change, right, Jeremy? So we don't want Godzilla number three climate change to happen. So your final message, Jeremy? Um, I have several final messages. I actually have a gift to the guy who actually answered my question. Yep. So, Wira. <laughs> I believe it, it is a gift all the way from Malaysia. <laughs> oh, it's a Maggie hot cup from Malaysia. It's curry flavor, is it? <laughs> Thank you so much for taking part. And this is for our Malaysian students who are studying here away from home. Tomorrow is Chinese New Year. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is pineapple tart. <laughs> so usually um, Chinese Malaysians they would love to have this pineapple tart to celebrate Chinese New Year and to open up the year of the red, the start of the Chinese zodiac. I give to you guys pineapple tart. Make sure you share to all your Japanese friends as well. Thank you so much, Harima. That's so thoughtful of you. Winning the girl's heart over there. <laughs> All right, so you have more words, right? Um, I think, I think um, that's what I want to show to, um, especially Japanese. You know, like Malaysia is one of the best and one of the few countries within a good example of several ra several races coming together, living in harmony. Malay, Chinese, and Indian. And that's what I want to start with. Why, if we can do it in Malaysia, why not the whole world? Why not we work together something? And I just want at least people from University of Kitakyushu come to Malaysia. See, see, see how different we are and try to learn something out of it and try to teach us also as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shah. As of the trip, I believe a lot, we have a lot to learn from Japanese, right? And from maybe from the floor, any last questions, any thoughts, anything that you want to share about urban resilience, maybe, or maybe anything at all. Okay, you as a youth, what do you think that you can do personally with regards to urban resilience? What what can you do? Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. So, Miss Miki, you want to go first? Uh, she wants to think first, so Shah. <laughs> All right. Uh, what can youth do for urban resilience? Start a discussion. Why, especially in Malaysia, why do we, why do we need to 
Why, why do we need to start talking about it? Why is it important for Malaysians? That's the whole point of this presentation that I did, is to educate not only Japanese but to Malaysians as well on why we need urban resilience. Because sadly, um, the current policy right now, the Sendai framework for the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, um, they they did a monitor called the Sendai framework monitor, and they see Malaysians are not ready towards and also not enough good data to 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 simply say that Malaysia is ready for a, an upcoming disaster risk. And that and that's why you should start discussing about it and talking about it. Thank you. That's it for now. All right, thank you, Shah. And Ms. Miki? I think the most important thing in my opinion is just running. Like we have to more like make sure that SDG like sustainability from UN. We have especially especially for Japanese people. We have to know more about the SDG goals, like to closer with us because we. I think we have a training from the student. I think it's a good point, but just we just finish just doing the training. We just that's it. But we not only training, but we have to also know more about the knowledge about the national disaster and also like resilience about resilience. So I need more running is important for us, especially with the young generation in Japan. Thank you so much, Miss Miki. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Hello, I'm Leong and I'm from Malaysia. Yeah, um, um, the presentation is mostly about the natural disaster, but I'm curious about because recently the China pneumonia, yeah, has spread it, yeah, and the ways the government or community that um to prevent or face the the disease, um, is it counted as a an urban resilient? And what is your opinion about that? Thank you. All right, thank you, Leong. Leong is a student from Malaysia that's studying here, studying Japanese, right? All right. So, Shot or Miss Miki, who wants to answer the question? Yeah. All right, sure. Um, this one vir virus will happen because the more we use antibiotics, the more the viruses will be immune to antibiotics. Well, it, it is an urban challenge, to be fair. Just today, I, I, I read somewhere in the news that they're containing the whole of Wuhan, not letting people out. Uh, and then this funny news where a Chinese lady who knows she has Wuhan disease but still wants to go to France because, yeah, Disneyland, just to enjoy, despite the fact she has a disease. So before this becomes a pandemic, Pandemic meaning a disease that could spread. Yes, cities should be resilient and should be prepared for an invisible outbreak. We cannot see, but it is still there. And it is a challenge, an urban resilience challenge. I think virus is kind of hard to prevent. So first, like the government update, update the news to the people in the country and they try to prevent other like airport, like they check the airport in the Japanese government doing right now because starting the Chinese New Year from today, yesterday. So yeah, the only thing we can do is just keep him or like, update all information yeah 
I think the best thing for only we can do for us. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Miki. She's saying like we should keep ourselves updated about information just to be cautious of what's happening around us, right? Okay. So I believe like uh, according to the question, it's like anything other than natural disaster is also part of urban resilience, yeah. right, Sha? Okay, so anything, any pressure towards the, this community that living in urban, rising price of houses, it's also contribute towards urban resilience. Anything that making a city sustainable to live in, right? All right, sure. Okay, any other questions before we wrap up the session? No? All right, okay, so... I just want to share uh, if after you guys already downloaded the uh, program book in that in there there is actually essays about urban resilience and Shah actually won the best essay that's how we got him here so if you want to read him his essay it's on the book about urban resilience and also other 11 candidates of Azure speaks uh, so they all wrote about urban resilience in there to get more information about urban resilience yeah all right I guess if there's no more question, then we wrap up the session. Thank you so much to Miss Miki from Japan, our new friend here. Thank you so much, Shah, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Professor, for your presentation as well. All right, and thank you so much for University of Kita Kyushu for hosting us today and also other uh, IYC, AYC, but uh, that's the end of the forum, but not the end of the program yet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.